You're all set. I should go. Okay. Good evening. On behalf of the Cuba program of the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University, I want to welcome you to this evening's webinar entitled Pablo Armando Fernandez, Memorias y Poesia, or Memories and Poetry. We have with us this evening several members of Pablo's family who will be speaking at some point. We also have several of his colleagues who are poets, novelists, and ensayistas. And we have, for Spice, a few academics. And all of the friends and family of Pablo Armando will offer some reminiscences as well as some will read poems of Pablo Armando that they have selected. If there is time at the end of the formal presentations, we will open the floor to people in the audience who may have reminiscences or may even have a poem of Pablo's that they would like to read. It will all depend on the amount of time left. And our moderator for this evening is Dr. Jean Capello, formerly a professor of Latin American literature at Rutgers University, as well as Fordham University. Jean, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, May. I'm very honored to be here this evening and certainly look forward to this uh, presentation of poems and memories in honor of the great Cuban poet, Pablo Armando Fernandez, who died last November at the age of 92. And just to tell the people, uh, our audience attending, all of our speakers from Cuba are speaking from Pablo Armando's house. Um, where one of his daughters now lives. And that makes it even more impactful, I think. We're going to start this evening with a video by Giselle Garcia, who is a very uh, well-known and uh, award-winning documentarian. The name of her video is Pablo Armando in Memoriam. Giselle, could you introduce it and get us started, please? Hello, everyone. Hope you can hear me well. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. This is, I, I, I'm really honored to be in such a, uh, a nice group of friends that we all love Pablo Armando so much. And obviously honored to be among such a group of talented uh, writers as well. Um, uh, I've looked up to all of you for my entire life. So it, it's quite a, a special moment for me as well. And I have to say that this is just a short video that I've put together. Uh, it's not intending to be, you know, something too um, explanatory of Pablo's life or his literature, really. It's just to get a taste of, you know, who he was as a person and as a human being, mostly. Um, so in order to do this, I just put together a few uh, photographs and I do apologize if I'm sure that all of you uh, probably still uh, pressure um, and still have a lot of photographs with Pablo that I would have loved to have in advance. So I do apologize if you're not included in it. Um, it's nothing personal. <laughs> it's just all the pictures that we could gather in the moment. But I think it's just, um, it's just that kind of video to pretty much uh, get into the mood and just to, uh, it, it's going to be nice to also listen to his voice again. Uh, so I hope you all enjoy it and um, thank you for having me and I'll let the video run then. Cheers.
Bueno, a mí me pasan cosas muy extrañas. En mis sueños reales, oh, sorry. no en mis en soñaciones. Can we pause for a second? There's also, I want to say, there's um, the video with subtitles, with the English subtitles. Ellen must have it. Ellen, Ellen have you got that video for the English subtitles? Um, let me see. This is the one that I had downloaded um, that was in the, the file transfer. Um, I can I can check and see if I have that one with the English subtitles yeah. and do that. It might take a moment. Um, if not, we can still watch it, but I will uh, be sending out the link then for in the English subtitles in case that you want to check that one out. So yeah, we definitely. Can continue watching this one, not, not an issue. Thank yeah, you. I'll be sure right. to circulate the link to all of the the panelists after this, all the attendees after this, if they want to watch it with the English subtitles. Um, yeah, thank right, you. Thank Sorry you. about that. <laughs> Yo doy mente de delicias. Por lo tanto, vivo en ella. Es eh, fija, eh, es extraña, me posee. Yo llegué a los Estados Unidos en 1945. Ese año cumplí 15 años. Y viví allí hasta 1959. Pues te diré que toda mi adolescencia real transcurrió en mi primera juventud en Nueva York. Y sigue siendo eh, la otra parte de mi vida. Pienso que... Fue muy extraño convertirme en poeta, porque yo en realidad escribía prosa. Eh, yo no tenía alma, porque yo no tenía una educación religiosa. Y en la búsqueda de mi alma la encontré en una escalera, eh, en la voz y en los ojos de una anciana, muy bella anciana, bellísima que yo le hablé en inglés y ella me dijo, yo no hablo inglés. Y, y a partir de ese momento yo frecuenté personas que le interesaba la religión como cultura. Toda mi poesía está sometida siempre a un metro. Yo siempre pienso que hay otra voz y que yo soy intérprete de esa voz, hago una representación física de ese ser, de ese ser que, que encontró su alma en una escalera y eso posiblemente sea mi poesía. Es una poesía muy espontánea, siempre sale de, de, de las circunstancias. Eh, a mí me conmueve mucho oír a alguien leer poesía mía en bengalí o en ucraniano Roata, y digo, ¿y esto qué suena? es? Que no, entiendo una sola, no entiendo una sola palabra, pero sé que están remitidos a un texto que, anterior que yo de algún modo eh, se, me, se me fue otorgado el hecho de poderlo transcribir en castellano y ellos pueden ponerlo en cualquier idioma. Y no. Mi madre quiere que yo sea feliz, quiere que sea joven y alegre. Un hombre que no tema el paso de los años, ni tema a la ternura ni al candor del niño que debiera ser cuando voy de su mano y la oigo repetirme para que no lo olvide estas y otras nociones. Mi madre no quisiera avergonzarse de mí. Mi madre quiere que no mienta, quiere que sea libre y sencillo. No quisiera verme sufrir, porque el miedo y la duda son males que padecen los adultos y ella quiere que yo sea su niño. Cualquiera que nos viese no la comprendería. En edad coincidimos, no quiere que lo diga. Aunque ella me dio vida cuando tenía los años que tengo hoy, Podríamos ser hermanos, ella un poco mayor. Podríamos ser amigos, 
su memoria y la mía corresponden a un tiempo en que ambos fuimos jóvenes. Yo era menor, pero recuerdo verla cantar feliz entre sus hijos, compartir nuestra infancia. Mi madre quiere verme luchar a toda hora contra el dolor y el miedo. Sufriría si supiera que a mi edad, la de ella entonces, cuando me dio a la vida, yo soy su viejo padre y ella mi dulce niña. Yo siempre pienso que solamente conozco a aquellas personas que de algún modo yo estoy destinado a ello. Estoy entre amigos y eso me hace muy feliz. Y estoy allí, estoy allí. Thank you. What a wonderful way to start our evening, Giselle. Thank you. We literally started with the La Voz del Poeta, no? We started with the poet in his own voice. And to follow upon that, we're going to hear from the esteemed Cuban poet Nancy Moracon, the 2021 winner of the Cuban Premio Nacional de Literatura and the National Aleco Carpentier Award. She'll be speaking to us from uh, Pablo Armando's house. These are among, what I've mentioned, are among her many honors as a poet, an essayist, and a translator. She's going to give an offer of remembrance and a poem. Nancy? Hello. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon to everybody. I will uh, speak in Spanish, okay? Y quería comenzar citando a Pablo, que decía, estamos entre amigos, tantas caras que nos hemos visto durante tantos años. Y una de las conexiones más grandes mías con Pablo Armando es exactamente su sentido de las islas, por supuesto las Antillas, mayores o menores del Caribe. Y yo quería leer un poema de su primer libro, Salterio y Lamentación, publicado en 1953, que tiene una cita, por supuesto, del Padre Nuestro, que dice, perdónanos nuestras deudas. Y ya desde entonces mencionaba Pablo, Islas del Caribe, escuchen. Válgame saber que Curazao no es solo un nombre en la calle donde el frutero vocifera su impaciencia donde una mujer mece su desesperación y un pequeñín gimotea por la pelota que ha roto la vidriera del usurero. Año 53, y ya parecía corazón. Eh, tanto le debo, hay que decir así, uno tiene que ser agradecido. Y yo, en un momento como este, aquí entre la descendencia de Pablo Armando Fernández tengo que mencionar también a Maruja, ¿por qué no? Tanto le debo a Maruja también. Entonces voy a leerles un poema eh, que yo escribí pero que ni Jeca, ni Bárbara, ni, ni Teresa, ninguno sabe, ninguno conoce. Eh, y, y tengo el gusto bueno de leerlo aquí para rendir tributo alguien cosmopolita, campesino y cubano universal. El poema se llama El tren pasó. Tal vez huyendo del batey, el tren que esperábamos pasó sin darnos cuenta. Fueron sus subidos en la noche los que anunciaron el trino de los gallos y el vapor de las tamboras. El poeta de cabellos blancos 
se trepó al highway y fue a parar a la estación de trenes para ver pasar el tren de su hora exacta. Esa hora que lo llevaría de la mano como un niño, el niño aquel corriendo sobre los raíles en delicias hacia los suburbios de Nueva York para continuar esperando al tren más lento, el del final, el suyo, junto a Manila y a Maruja, en pleno andén, ardiendo entre las sombras, entre las sombras, ardiendo en pleno andén. Muchas gracias. gracias. Me acompañé, me quise acompañar de este pequeño librito que Pablo me regaló, donde está un folio, donde está el poema de Curazao. Y, y, y en mi casa, en la sala de mi casa, que hay libros y libros y libros y libros. El primer libro que se ve es ese, con esta imagen. Así que les agradezco mucho haber podido compartir esto. A Gabriela, a Pablito, a Nina Serrano, que hace tanto que no nos vemos, a Sandra, a Luis Brenner y a mi gran amiga Margaret Clark. Hasta pronto. Thank you so much. And we now are going to be hearing from Philip Brenner. Philip had a very distinguished career at American University in Washington and has multiple books on the Cuban Revolution and Cuban-US relations. These all make him one of our preeminent scholars in the field. He also is going to be giving us a remembrance and a poem. Philip? Thank you very much. It's a sad honor to be in this group of people who love Pablo. And let me start by telling you that the poem I selected, Sweet for Maruja, uh, is uh, an ode to uh, Maria Julia Gonzalez to whom Pablo was married more than 50 years. And those of us who are close to Pablo know that she was not only his wife, but she was his soulmate. Indeed, it would be difficult to know that Pablo had reached his full human potential without the support and love and nurturance that Maruja gave to him. Um, and so it was fitting that he wrote this suite, which consists of actually seven different poems written over a series of 10 years. Uh, part of the poems are very poignant because they, a few of the poems are very poignant because they reflect the time when Moreau was near death uh, from cancer and Pablo very much worried that she would die. Uh, but it also reflects his deep love and uh, his, his passion. But let me, and I'm sorry that I'm gonna read it in English. Uh, and I'll do you the favor of not abusing the Spanish language. Um, almost always and alone, we speak in the doorway, just the two of us, or in the kitchen, which is the same thing, about friends, their names are words that I choose, like someone enjoying a flower or a fruit, a remote jewel which you keep safe. My love, you never, you never ending mystery. We gather together, hour by hour, my dispersed being from memories we have not shared, unattainable names which the child remembers in a fleeting adolescence. It upsets me to have forgotten them, current names mind today, fleeing noisily in silence or solitude, hours. I am hurting, you know, days gnaw us away. To whom should I speak to my heart? Laying it wide open? I suffer, 
until you calm my suspicions by telling me a story of bad children who turn out to be good and good children whom history defames. And the last poem in the suite. Quietly, my love, to speak your name next to you, to your ear, to your mouth, and to be happy, to be that happy animal which joins its halves, quietly or silently, the voiceless mouth restored to its unity, inaugural silence which grants new life to the words and the flesh, the eyes blind returning to the whole, light revealing wor worlds as they were or are, as they shall be, back being each other's joy by oneself in company. Another life, yours, so beloved, back to being origin without sadness or pain, without fear, nor nostalgia or with them. You and I, our memories and ashes. If there were time, I would read another poem of the same sort, Learning to Die. But I, at this point, I'll just speak of two meaningful remembrances about Pablo. One is about his relationship to my family. We adopted both of our, my wife and I, Betsy, adopted our children from Colombia. And when, and our first child was named Sarah. Um, and as we were about to adopt our second child, who we knew would be a boy, Pablo was staying with us while he was visiting in Washington. And he, we talked about the adoption and he said, well, what will you name the boy? And we said, well, we haven't really come up with a name yet. We want to have a name that's similar in Spanish and in English because they were being adopted from Colombia. And he said, well, you must name him Isaac. And we said, why? And he said, well, because Isaac was a gift from God to Sarah and he made her laugh. Of course, she laughed because she was 96 years old and how could I possibly, but his point was, it was full of life. Giving Isaac the name Isaac was a way of giving him life. And Isaac once did a painting, Pablo, that Pablo hung in a special place in the house, well, almost next to a Monet. I mean, it, an honored place, uh, which was very, very special for uh, Isaac, when we went and visited Pablo, when the uh, my son and daughter visited him for the last time uh, in 2017, Isaac saw the painting hanging, and it meant so much to him. A second story, a story that reveals Pablo's love for Cuba, for the revolution, and for people. Uh, in 1980. Pablo was finally allowed to get a passport again. Uh, and uh, he was invited to come to the United States to speak at several universities, including my own. And uh, in order to get the visa, finally, he, uh, from the US interest section at the time, from the US government, he needed to go to the US interest section, which is now the US embassy in Havana. This was a time, and April of 1980, just before the so-called Mariel Exodus. And at this point, there were long lines outside the interest section. He described it as 500 people or more, all waiting to get a precious visa. Uh, this is before Mariel. And Pablo, dressed very formally as he always did, uh, walked up to the head of the line as he tells the story, and people started shouting at him, get back. Who the hell do you think you are? Go to the back of the line. And he said it gave him such a great joy that people talked to him that way. And the reason he said was that these are people who wanted to leave Cuba, but Cuba had left them something. It left them a measure of dignity. He said 20 years earlier had, a man such as myself, dignified, dressed very well, 
moved up to the front of the line, people would have shuffled away and tried to uh, let him go by. But these people had a sense of self-respect and dignity. And he said, that's what the revolution had given them. Uh, and he was so proud of them. He was proud of the revolution and he just enjoyed humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. And now we're going to hear from Nancy Sedano speaking to us from California. She's a distinguished poet and educator. Much of her work is focused on increasing access to poetry, social justice, and the arts, particularly with uh, high school and, and even younger students. She worked in radio for many years with Comunicación Aztlán and has won any number of international film awards. Nina, I don't, there you are. Yes. The floor is yours. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Margaret Curran and Columbia University for providing this great international opportunity to honor and remember Pablo Armando Fernandez and his poetry. I'm going to be reading this. My memories of Pablo Armando Fernandez begin in 1968, a hasty introduction in front of a tall Havana apartment building a charming man, animated, full of poetry. My next memory is more detailed. Gathered around the green tiled kitchen counter of his new home in the Miramar district, amid stately charming residences, embassies and schools, Pablo explained how his personal friend, Celia Sanchez, Fidel Castro's aide, had found the house for his family. The kitchen is ampled. The big stove against the rear back wall is by the door, leading to a yard full of plants and trees. The room is full of light. Next to it is the dining room. There, years later, I remember watching with pride as Pablo put the little gold demitasse cup I had brought for his coffee cup collection in the rounded glass cabinet. With every visit to his house, Pablo would proudly lead me on a tour of the new renovations or repairs that had been made since my last visit. The house itself was an important member of the family. First, there were three children, Heka, Teresa, Pablito, and in time, Barbara. Often Pablo and his down-to-earth wife, Maruja Gonzalez, were our guests at the elegant Tavana Libre Hotel dining room. But more wonderfully prepared were the meals cooked and served by Maruja. How I loved hearing her play the old upright piano along the living room wall, including the popular songs of our era and Cuban standards. To quote an excerpt from my own poem, Open Hearts, Closed Borders, about her passing, I wrote, My heart journeys without visa or passport, melting over borders and time. I see Maruja, her eyebrow arching knowingly with a hint of doubt and humor. She is smiling at me. We are young women again. She is holding a tray of tiny espresso cups, sandals flip-flopping across the cool tile of the floor in a house dress or high heels clicking above a trim ankle, swarthed in company best. She sits at the piano, songs rippling under her fingers, delicious food sizzles in a frying pan, light and perfectly seasoned the aroma wafting through the antique settings of the rooms. She is the queen of her kitchen and loves to be at home. That was an excerpt from my poem. My favorite memories of visits to Pablo's house are from 1974, when I spent a year from 1974 to 75 living in Havana and in the countryside. 
Philip Brenner informs me that that year is often called the gray period during the 10 years when Pablo and other blacklisted writers could not publish. Pablo and I formed a literary society of which we were the two exclusive members. One or two nights a week, I would come to his home and we would read to each other what we had been writing. His accented English was very British, reflecting his happy years as a cultural attache at the Cuban embassy in London in the 1960s. During our sessions, Pablo wrote an entire novel, I forget which one, but I remember his sleepy arms, waving gestures as the plot spun from the suburb of the story to another suburb. My own novel took a few more decades to be completed. Sometimes during our poetry society sessions, I would help him with translations from his day job as a translator at a science institute. I remember a difficult one about the nature of pink marble, which is indigenous to Cuba. A group of, pin, a group of printers at that work center surprised Pablo by printing up a booklet of his poems. He was deeply moved. Fortunately, a day came when Pablo's work was widely published and honored. He was invited to read everywhere. He was even honored at the International Book Fair in Havana. In 2011, I returned to Cuba. I had heard that Pablo was ill, but I was not prepared for him to be wheeled out to greet me in a wheelchair. We were able to converse and I recorded a short interview for my radio program. He tired easily and our interview ended. In the 80s, I translated this poem, Parabola, because it was so beautiful. It was published in our small Latinx literary magazine, Tintan. Parable by Pablo Armando Fernandez. You heard it in Spanish at the beginning of this program. My mother wants me to be happy, wants me to be young and joyful a man who doesn't fear the passing of the years, nor fears the tenderness or candor of the child that I should be. When I let go of her hand, I hear her repeating to me so that it's not forgotten those and other notions. My mother doesn't want to be ashamed of me. My mother wants me not to lie, wants me to be free and simple. She wouldn't want to see me suffer because fear and doubt are faults born by adults and she wants me to be her child. Whoever sees us won't understand it because she doesn't want it said we coincide in age, although she gave life to me when she was as old as I am now. We could have been sister and brother, she a little older. We could have been friends. Her memory and mine correspond to a time when we were both young. I was younger, but I remember seeing her sing happily among her children, sharing our childhood. My mother wants to see me fight at all times against pain and fear. She would suffer if she knew that at my age, hers, when she gave me life, I am her old father and she, my sweet daughter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. That was truly lovely. We now are going back to Cuba to hear from Reynaldo Gonzalez Zamora who like Nancy is a winner of the Cuban Premio Nacional de Literatura. Uh, his was in the year 2003. He is a longstanding member of the Academia Cubano de la Lengua, as well as being a very noted poet, essayist and journalist. And he will be giving a remembrance of Pablo Armando. 
Reinaldo. Buenas tardes. Espero que pueda. Tengo que declarar que estoy muy, muy emocionado porque con este tipo de información que estamos elaborando, espero, quiero estar hablando con Pablo Lomar. Y esto es un regalo. Esto es realmente un milagro. Que es un milagro que da la tecnología, etcétera, pero que da sobre todo la amistad. La amistad es más capaz de regalar milagros que la tecnología. La amistad si es buena no traiciona. La, te la tecnología sí puede traicionar. Y en esta ocasión, en que estamos además los hijos de Pablo, estamos los amigos, algunos de los amigos más cercanos en Cuba de Pablo y a través de esta de estas cámaras de ustedes. La memoria gana un espacio mayor, gana un espacio que puede doler o que puede alegrar. Pensar que voy a tener cerca otra vez a Pablo Armando, como tantas veces estuvimos en Cuba o en el mundo, y algunas veces con Maruja. Nos divertíamos mucho. Podíamos convertir cada rincón de cada ciudad que íbamos en un trozo de Cuba. Si estábamos en Nueva York, conocíamos espacios que tocó José Martí, el mayor milagro. Si estábamos en España, conocíamos también los espacios que tocó José Martí. Tuve dos o tres viajes fundamentales con Pablo a lugares que crecieron ante mi memoria más por haber estado precisamente con Pablo Armando. Pablo Armando ha sido para mí no solamente un amigo entrañable, un amigo de una intimidad total, sino de momento me regaló sus hijos. Soy el tío de todos. Y así me han tratado y así hemos sido. Y Pablo Armando también me acercó muchos rincones de la poesía. Juntos conocimos que la poesía tiene muchas formas de mostrarse y de, y de querer. No es que queramos nosotros la poesía, es que la poesía nos quiera a nosotros. Y cuando uno está cerca de una persona como Pablo Armando, siente ese regalo realmente con una fuerza que, que te electriza, que te, que te domina. Y debo decir con Pablo que también me regaló muchos trozos de mi propio país y de las imágenes y de la filosofía y de la fe en el país. We seem to have a technical glitch. Ellen, are you able to see what's going on that's holding up their transmission? Um, yeah, it just looks like there's some kind of internet issue on their end. Um, I can uh, get in contact with Raul and see what's up, um, but I'll get back to you. Yeah, I think that it just looks like they had some kind of connection interruption. All right, we'll just wait, obviously, and patiently wait. Looks like they might be back on. Yeah. Espero que esta circunstancia no altere lo que quiero decirle. Esta ocasión única de tener de nuevo cerca de mí a Pablo Armando Fernández. Hay algunos, hubo algunos momentos en mi vida que estuvieron muy vinculados a Pablo. En particular, un concurso Casa de las Américas, en que Pablo ganó el premio y yo la primera mención. Yo conocía su novela tanto o más que él, y él la mía, porque nos habíamos ayudado mutuamente a darle cuerpo a esas novelas, a manejar las escenas, los capítulos, 
eran como si yo hubiera escrito parte del libro de Pablo y Pablo parte de mi libro. Puedo decir que cierta picardía en aquel momento quiso hallar eh, desencuentros que no tenían camino con Pablo y conmigo. Y nos reíamos, hacíamos la maldad. Yo escribí un largo ensayo sobre su novela y él terminó escribiendo el prólogo de un libro de poemas míos. Siempre estuvimos juntos en Madrid o en Estados Unidos o en varios países latinoamericanos y siempre les puedo contar, éramos dos tontos riéndonos, disfrutando. Éramos, volvemos a ser, como él decía, los niños. Los niños que no se despiden, como en su novela. Eran los niños que siempre se acercan más. Y una, algo que Pablo me enseñó y que ha hecho, ha sido uno de los cuerpos fundamentales de su obra y de su poesía, es la capacidad de usar los mitos como presencia firme al lado tuyo. He escogido hoy para leerles un poema exacto, brevísimo, pero que tiene una carga exactamente de esto que estoy diciendo. La capacidad de Pablo Armando Fernández de darle cuerpo a la imaginación religiosa. Es una provocación también de mezclar religiones como lo hacemos en Cuba constantemente. En Cuba no somos de una religión, somos de una mezcla de religiones. Y si alguien sabía esto, era Pablo Armando Fernández. Voy a leerles un poema que le dedicó a Aide Santa María. Pero él no dice Aide Santa María. Llama Ochum Yeye Cari. Ochum Yeye Cari es una variante de la Virgen de la Caridad del Pobre en el catolicismo. Pero visto desde las maravillosas culturas africanas que vinieron a reñirse con el catolicismo en Cuba, a hacer un maridaje de religiones. Nadie entendió ese extraño mundo como Pablo Armando Fernández. Y además de esto, era como, una, como una, un, profesional, un profesional de manejarlo como juego. Mucha gente no creo que haya entendido a Pablo. Pablo todo el tiempo jugaba. Cuando va a publicar su primera gran novela, que es una novela extraordinaria, le llama Los niños se despiden. Era como que ahí, con esa novela, dejaba la infancia y entraba en los problemas, digámoslo así. Porque después de la infancia vienen los problemas. Y Pablo sabía esto. El mayor regalo que me hizo Pablo, siempre, ha sido esta hermosa familia, Maruja y sus hijos que son mis hijos, mis sobrinos, que me he sentido siempre parte de la familia y ellos han sido conmigo muy regalones, una palabra de español que usamos en América, regalones. Maruja y Pablo me regalaron una familia y yo me incorporé a ella. Las historias de Maruja y Pablo conmigo en Madrid o en Andalucía era para empezar a contarlas porque siempre tenía un trasfondo de humor y de picaresca, que ellos dos manejaban muy bien. Maruja era una mujer de una inteligencia callada, de una inteligencia superior, y se entendía con ese diablito que podía ser Pablo Armando Fernández. Y, y sus hijos me han querido como un tío. Pero yo he querido a Pablo, además, como se quiere al paisaje como se quiere al país. Él me regalaba aspectos del país que yo no sabía ver, que yo aprendí a ver con él. Eso está en el poema que he escogido. Y eso está en tantas veces que nos vimos y que la vida fue tan generosa de sentarlo a mi lado, de ir a las provincias, andar. En Cuba, cuando hay el festival del libro, la feria del libro, vamos todos haciendo una travesía por las provincias. Yo siempre iba con Pablo, porque disfrutaba la feria y Pablo. Pablo ha sido una compañía generosa, un amigo portentoso, que además 
me ha querido mucho como hijo, como hermano. Él me ha regalado su poesía y yo he aprendido a quererlo a través de ella. Voy a leerles un poema que tiene significados un tanto esotéricos y que quizás ustedes necesiten que explique. Tiene un título curiosísimo. Una campesina que la nombra Yeye Kari. Yeye Kari son una variante que en la religión negra o yoruba tiene la Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre, que es una virgen que vino a Cuba, traída por el mar, era como un mascarón de proa, y aquí ganó una empatía extraordinaria. Acaba de haber en este espacio en Cuba una enorme exposición de más de 50 artistas regalando una obra cada uno a esta virgen, a esta negra, Oshun, Oshun Yeye Kari, que es la virgen de la caída del pobre, nuestra patrona. Yo, que no soy religioso, aprendí con Pablo a respetar la religión y amar a quienes son tan generosos de profesarla, de, de estar enamorados de su religión. Cuando estuve buscando un poema que fuera breve y al mismo tiempo tan significativo, pensé exactamente en este poemita brevísimo de Pablo. Se llama, como pueden ya esperar, una campesina que le nombra Yeye Cari. Cari de caridad del pobre. Dice su nombre y es como si juntara en los labios todos los viejos nombres de mujer o de hombre. Y la garganta se le pone vieja de llamarla con nombres de la historia. La Virgen está historiada. Claro. Está parada como piedra viva, señalando caminos de agua y tierra. Dibujado su rostro por el dedo del monte. En la religión de los negros de origen africano en Cuba, el monte donde están los árboles, las hierbas, es fundamental. Ahí está el misterio. Ahí está la posibilidad de salvarse o de curarse la, la enfermedad breve. Dibujado en su rostro por el dedo de la, de la, del monte para perdón, mal, 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 para mostrarnos la grande y la menor. Y un día que no, vi, que no vino, se supone la, ella lo sorprendía a él, y él no, ese día no vino, y perdone que estoy haciendo esta explicación, porque sé que en términos que ustedes manejan, la religiosidad es otra. Pero Tampoco es de la tierra, dice. Tiene como su nombre, vieja, viejo los ojos para mirar el mundo. Si con, conociera una alegría más grande, la llamaría por sus viejos nombres. Quiere siempre decirnos, Pablo, y estas cosas puedo decirlas porque me las explicaba. Yo era realmente alguien que no manejaba estos elementos, digamos, esotéricos. Pablo sí lo hacía y muy bien, porque él era el poeta. Él entendía la poesía como una especie de andar entre mitos y hallarles la razón que el ojo no avisado no ve. Él ve esa otra parte del mito. Yo tuve con Pablo verdaderos aprendizajes. Porque yo venía de un mundo muy distinto. Cuando Pablo me, me hablaba de Nueva York, y cuando después fui a Nueva York con Pablo, y, y anduvimos, que esto no he hablado nunca, anduvimos en aquellos lugares donde estuvo José Martín. Sandra Levinson nos, pre, nos presentó a un amigo que fue muy generoso de llevarnos a esos lugares. Aquí estuvo Martín. En esta oficinita pequeña, el, el, el apóstol de Cuba fragó la guerra de la independencia. Aquí estaba tal cosa. Era, era este hombre 
Gregorio, creo que se llamaba Sandra, me lo podría aclarar. Este hombre fue nuestro conductor, pero Pablo le rectificaba, porque Pablo había hecho antes, en su periodo neoyorquino, donde no siempre tuvo alegría, donde no siempre tuvo compensación para la vida, pero donde tuvo el mayor tesoro, conocer a Maruja y hacer su vida y tener esta familia que son, es mía. Y este poema pequeño, fíjense que mezcla el nombre que en Cuba los negros le dan a la santa, a Ochun, que es a su vez la Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre. ¿Y de qué habla Pablo? De la sonrisa y de los ojos. No le da un atributo superior, le da un atributo carnal que podemos ver y tocar. Y esta es parte de la sabiduría de la religión de los negros en Cuba que a veces los blancos no sabemos entender, porque vamos la filosofía, vamos muy doctos, y la cosa a veces no es de ser docto, sino de ser bueno. Y en cuestión de bueno, no conozco otro mejor que Pablo Armando. Bueno, gracias, so much. We're getting such a full picture of this wonderful man. And we'll continue with Sandra Levinson, a New York-based scholar who, in addition, is the founder and executive director of the Center for Cuban Studies and the curator of the center's art space. Having traveled more than 300 times to Cuba, Sandra is often consultant to news organizations, and she leads tours to Cuba. Sandra? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK. Well, <clears throat> I was very lucky in my first trip to Cuba, because on July 4th, 1969, el primer día de mi primer visita, yo conocí a Pablo Armando Fernandez. Oh, wow. And because of Pablo Armando Fernandez, whom I knew because of Nina Serrano and Saul Landau, and Pablo introduced me to Reynaldo Gonzalez, who became my brother, and Reynaldo, introduced me to Nancy Morahone, who became my daughter. <laughs> so the connections and the love I feel for all of you who love Pablo is enormous. I'm very honored that you asked me to be here and to be a part of this. Ojalá que pudiera hablar en un español lindo para conmemorar a Pablo, pero como tú sabes, yo hablo así. <laughs> <laughs> and in the very first week that I was there, Pablo, Pablito, and I went swimming <laughs> and got caught by a terrible Caribe and were very, very, I was very sick because I was burning up. I had all these little bugs all over me. But my, my journey with Pablo began the very first day. And although I suppose it ended with his passing, it didn't really end because as you have all pointed out, his capacity for friendship, his capacity for love was enormous. And <clears throat> I think most of all, Pablo taught me how to love Cuba. He taught me how difficult it could be to love Cuba sometimes. He taught me how important it was to love Cuba. And all of us know how much our friendship for Pablo and for one another means to us. I have a couple of little stories I'll mention um, that I've probably told all of you before, but not our larger audience. Um, Philip talked about how important Pablo was to his family. And I want to say how important Pablo was to my family too. The last time that we were all together was actually for my sister's 90th birthday. And we spent a wonderful time in Pablo's house with Pablo and Nancy Morajone and Marta Rojas 
my sister, my brother, all of the people who accompanied us to celebrate Mimi's 90th birthday. And that made us reminisce about a couple of things. One, when my dad died in 1983 and my mother was clearing out the closet, she said, you know, I think Pablo was the same size as your father. I think I'll give Pablo some of daddy's clothes. And I know he has the same size shoe. And so she very carefully went through and picked out the most important or the most beautiful clothes she could find and sent them down with me. And from that day forward, every time Pablo put on a pair of shoes or a jacket of my dad's, he would say, Hoy estoy poniendo el chaquete de papi. I said, oh, thank you, Pablo, for telling me. And then in 1998, when Pablo was in the United States, I'm not sure if he was in Washington or in Chicago at the time he called me, but my mother had just died. And I told Pablo, and Pablo said, I'm coming to Minneapolis right now. I said, what do you mean you're coming to Minneapolis? Your mother died, I want to be with you. And the next day he was in Minneapolis and it happened that I was there not because my mother had died but because we were planning a fundraiser for the Center for Cuban Studies. And Pablo said, I will read poetry at the fundraiser. And he proceeded to read several of his poems starting with a poem about the death of his mother. So Pablo is very, very much a part, not only of my political and emotional life, but also of my family. And when I tried to think of what poem to read, I wanted somehow to read something that connected what Pablo taught me the most about friendship and love, not only for him and his family, but for Cuba. So the poem I'm going to read, and I wish I were reading it in Spanish, I apologize. I can almost not see, I have so little light here, is A Brief Ode of Love to the Homeland. Pequeña Oda de Amor a la Patria. And if someone suddenly should ask our country, my people, what and who are we? What would I reply? I would not give the answer learned as a child in a text which lovingly denies that there are words in human language capable of defining such things. Although here, as elsewhere, it is only natural that daily and in different ways people are born or die. The beauty of it is that we should wish for our birth or death to happen here. Because this was described, <laughs> sorry, as the most beautiful, <laughs> sorry, as the most beautiful land seen by man. The sweetest, most fragrant and pleasant under the glow of a reborn sun. I should not forget, also at times it was bitter and melancholic. It moved away from us and we sought it out in distant memories, half forgotten through grief. Or fear of the obscure motives of love. Not a ridiculous, obsessive, irrational love, but a necessary and painful one. Not love of readily accepted beauty for its great goodness or from habit, nostalgia for the past or an illusion of the present, but for what is born and what dies. I think that Pablo's love for Cuba, love for Heka, for Teresa, for Maruja, for Pablito, for Barbara, who was born as I came to Cuba, 
was something incredible because he was able to embrace so many people with so much love. He put so much into his friendship and his love. He gave you his all. And that made us give him what we could give of our all. It was a precious gift. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. What a beautiful remembrance. And now we'll hear from Meg Crahan. She has had a varied and storied academic career. For 12 years, she was the Henry Luce Professor of Religion, Power and Polit Political Process at Occidental College. She then was the Dorothy Epstein Professor at City College before coming to Columbia University, where she is a senior research scholar and directs the Cuba program. And we have her to thank largely for tonight, getting all of this organized. Um, as she directs the Cuba program for the Institute for Latin American Studies. She has written many outstanding books on a, and written articles on a wide range of topics. Meg? Thank you very much, Jean. I first met Pablo on my first visit to Cuba in 1973. Miguel Barnet, author of Runaway Slave, or better said, Cimarron, and a group of actors and musicians staged a play based on Cimarron in El Parque Lenin, to which Miguel invited me. And it was held in a natural bowl with on one side a hill where we the audience sat and on the other side where the actors performed. And at the end of the presentation, which was quite extraordinarily extraordinary, I started down the hill to give my congratulations to Miguel Barnet. And while I was walking down the hill, I saw this man with an amazing head of white hair walking towards me. And he walked up to me and said, Tu eres Meg. And I said to him, Tu eres Pablo Armando. We had not met before then but we had heard about each other and we had heard that we must get together. And at that time, and at that moment, Pablo Armando threaded my hand through his arm and said in English, let's go have some tea. And we did, we walked to a tea, Japanese tea shop within Parque Lenin, where we had tea and talked and talked and talked. And Pablo, as others have mentioned, had an intense sense of family. And he adopted a good number of us into his family. And he also had a certain type of extrasensory perception. In the late 70s, I was in Cuba when he said to me, you're having a birthday on June 2nd, aren't you? And I said, yes. How did you know? And he said, I just knew. And Maruha and I will have the birthday party at our home, which they did. And I was there with a group of students and they all were invited. And Maruha baked a cake that because the stove was a little bit off kilter, took eight hours to bake, but it was delicious. And then Maruha and others sat down at the piano and played, including Pablo's 
good friend Odilia Urfe and other musicians. And the party expanded until everybody on the street was there, enjoying the music, enjoying the birthday cake, et cetera. And in 1984, I was again in Cuba when I received news that my mother had died unexpectedly. About 15 minutes after I received the news or I was packing to go to the airport, Pablo Armando called and he said, what's wrong? And I said, how do you know? And he said, I felt it. And he said, your mother. And I said, yes, my mother has died. And he said, I will be right over. The last time I saw Pablo Armando was in December, 2019, together with Phil Brenner, when Pablo already was bedridden and we went to the house and we went up to his bedroom and he looked up and he said, hello, Phil. And then he said to me, Meg, give me a kiss, which I did. And we said goodbye. Pablo wrote a poem about the first time we met in the Parque Lenin in 1973. It's up on your screens. And I'm going to have the temerity to read it in my Spanish. It's entitled Criatura de la Luz. Para Meg, con las manos tendidas. La luz entre las fondras y la hierba. De la tarde en el parque. El autor, los actores y los músicos abandonan la escena. El público los rodea. Ahora estamos de regreso al presente. El pasado y el viejo cimarrón se alejan. En la colina, la tarde gana en intimidad. El sol declina. Entre la multitud que se desperta lenta, la luz corona la cabeza de una muchacha. Tú eres Meg. Su sonrisa sosiega mi impaciencia. La luz en su rostro se posa. Y un fulgor de otros soles ilumina sus ojos. Todo a su derredor es luminoso. Sus manos extendidas me reciben. Y siento y veo cómo se transforma la escena mientras los dos hacemos el camino que nos traza la luz. Entro a su lado al reino circular de la escritura. Criatura de la luz. Recupero siguiéndote. Memorias de otros tiempos y andanzas. Tú me devuelves cuanto usurpo el olvido y me enseñas a mirar sin zozobras. Lo que hace el camino hacia adelante. Todo tú resplandeces al mostrarme los signos que animaron la palabra. Con todo mi amor, Pablo Armando. Adiós a Pablo. Thank you so much, May. It's so clear this evening that all of our speakers feel like in one way or another, they're the children of Pablo Armando Fernandez. They all have felt so much a part of his family. 
And it's been wonderful that they've been here this evening to share these remembrances. The next speaker we're going to hear from is one of Pablo's biological children, I guess we would say. Uh, our final speaker will be Teresa de Jesus Fernandez Gonzalez. She is going to speak to us uh, from her father's house in Cuba. She, among many other things, is a longstanding member of the Union Nacional de Escritores y Artistas in Cuba. And we are so glad to have her with us this evening. Teresa? Hola, buenas noches. Y, y ante todo, gracias a Meg, gracias a Philip, a, a Nina, a Sandra, a Jean, eh, por, eh, por este recordatorio y a Giselle por su, por su video. Eh, bueno, por algo que decía Reinaldo, porque es un momento de pensar en él, de recordarlo, pero sobre todo con las personas que, que realmente lo amaron, que fueron sus amigos de ambas orillas, como él también amó a ambas orillas. Eh, no podría decir muchas cosas, por supuesto, porque le debo mucho, sobre todo de la sabiduría de lo que significa ser un ser humano. Y eso es lo que más le agradezco. Ese legado que ambos, mi madre y mi padre, nos dieron a sus cuatro hijos. Ese sentido humanista, ese sentido de pertenencia a un lugar, a una familia, a unas amistades y a, y a un amor. Pero yo quiero recordar también a mi padre por un sentido lúdico que él tenía de la vida, por una manera de saber estar, de sonreír, de apreciar las cosas bellas y de hacer de sus memorias o de sus recuerdos, de sus recuerdos más preciados, de sus reminiscencias también, poesía. Y yo me acuerdo cuando lo acompañaba muchas veces en Italia, a algunos de sus recitales, él siempre escogía un poema dedicado a Carmen Miranda porque era uno de los tantos personajes que, que poblaron su mundo de joven y de adolescente eh, ligado al cine, a la música, a la poesía, al amor. Y, y eso también era mi padre, efectivamente. Entonces voy a leer, ojalá lo pueda leer bien, este poema a Carmen Miranda. Enana descomunal, Sigues son los turbantes que sobre tu cabeza alzaban selvas más suntuosas que las amazónicas. Sigues en zancos bailando zambas desde Río a Los Ángeles. Qué bobería no pisar el suelo, tocar las nubes con la cabeza, Carmen, miniatura barroca. Eras un guacamayo psicodélico, eras con estas proporciones de tu fantasía, un incesante anuncio de neón. ¿Qué se hicieron tus ojos rococó más vertiginosos que los de Eddie Cantor? Y tu boca, que en cierto, se, que, que en cierto se, que en, que en secreto envidiaron Martha Ray y John Brown. Y tus brazos y manos asombro del dios Chiva. Ay, chica, chica, boom, chica. En zancos y con turbantes medías cinco pies, nueve pulgadas. Sin embargo, los muchachos te soñaban desnuda con tu tamaño humano, menudo, frágil. Si hay cielos, Carmen, en el tuyo has de estar como llegaste al mundo, orgullosa de medir cinco pies que los dioses disputan. No necesitarás el artificio de zancos y turbantes que inconscientes hacían propaganda a los productos de la, fruit, de la United Fruit y a las empresas transatlánticas. Ya no serás una muñeca, no serás un producto de los trópicos, una exquisita golosina. Si hay cielos, Carmen, a tu cielo carioca llegan César Romero y Tyron Power, Alice Faye, Don Ameche, Adolf Menjú, y toda la comparsa que seguía tus andanzas desde Río a Los Ángeles. Y ya no son los mismos. Si hay cielos, Carmen, y tu, a tu cielo carioca llegarán los muchachos que querían quitarte la saya y el corpiño de volantes, los pulsos y collares, hasta dejarte solo carne limpia 
que los dioses disputan. Si hay cielos carne, en el tuyo estarás a tus antojos, mi chica, chica, boom, chica. En fin. Yo pienso que si hay cielos, mi padre también en estos momentos está a sus antojos con sus amigos. Y muchas gracias de nuevo por esto. Thank you so much for those words and for the lovely poem. And I understand that Barbara would now like to read a poem. There you are. Buenas noches. Primero, quiero agradecer en mi nombre, en nombre de toda mi familia, a me por haber organizado esta cosa tan bonita, es lo más bonito que, que le hemos hecho a, a mi padre después que falleció. Gracias a todos ustedes por su cariño, por su dedicación, por estar siempre con esta familia. De mi papá podría decir tantas cosas, casi todas las han dicho ustedes, pero... Eh, eh, lo primero que viene a mi mente siempre es la familia. Eh, mi papá fue un hombre que la familia para él era lo más importante. Su familia consanguínea y su familia espiritual, que la componen todos ustedes y otros muchos amigos por el mundo, y siempre, siempre nos enseñó a, a amar a la familia, a estar para la familia. Fue un padre excepcional. Nos enseñó a, 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 a que lo más importante siempre era el amor, ayudar, eh, estar al lado de las personas. Y para mí lo más lindo y lo más preciado que me dejó es eso, mi familia, toda mi familia, la de él, sus hermanos, mis primos, mis hermanas, mi, mi hermano, mi, mi, mi sobrina, mi sobrina nieta, que también tenemos, Marina, eh, eso para mí es lo más importante que dejó mi papá. Voy a leer un poema que se llama Tanca de Identidad, porque eh, a mí me gusta mucho viajar, como le gustaba a él, y siempre teníamos nuestras conversaciones sobre los viajes y el mundo. Entonces, he visto el mundo y de él guardo una imagen, confusa multitud siempre en acecho. Conocer cierta gente me ha hecho sospechar que ser distinto es otra adecuación. El complicado mundo simplificó mi vida. La gente simple complicó mi mundo. Quiero agradecer a Giselle, a Jim, a Nancy, a Reinaldo, a Raulito, que sin él esto no hubiera podido suceder, porque es quien nos ha propiciado toda esta tecnología en la casa, y a todos ustedes, el amor de toda esta familia, que es la suya también. Muchas gracias. And thank you so much. Would Pablo or Gabriela like to speak? I know you were with us before. I don't know if Hola, hola. Sí. Sí. Hola, estamos aquí, Gaby, eh, Marina, como dijo Barbarita, eh, y yo. Eh, realmente emocionados con todo lo que está pasando, que ha sido de muy buen gusto, muy atinado, con gente muy querida, todas. Me gustaría mencionar a Sol. Eh, que también estuvo muy vinculado a él, solo andó, 
eh, así como ustedes, los que, los que pasaron por esta casa, eh, me agrada mucho que haya sido tan íntimo y humano. Y en esto consiste lo que yo llamo el buen gusto, aunque se ha hecho esta, este recordatorio, este pequeño homenaje. Es emocionante para nosotros eh, ver a mi hermana y todo, y a cada uno de ustedes también emocionado. Entonces, eh, muchas gracias. Eh, les gracias. mando abrazos, besos, y continuaremos haciendo cosas parecidas eh, que nunca van a ser demasiadas para él. Besos a todos. Gracias. Abrazos. Y muchas gracias. Oh, it's been wonderful for all of us to have you family members particularly with us, but to have all of our speakers has been really moving to have this memorial uh, for Pablo Armando Fernandez. It's been a wonderful evening. Meg, you thought there was perhaps someone else in New York who wanted to, we do have some time. Yes, uh, Peggy Gilpin uh, said she would like to say something, but she hasn't appeared in the chat room. So I don't think she is with us uh, now. Um, unless if she goes into the chat room right now, Ellen? I don't see her. No. no. She's not in the chat room, so um, we'll just have to have her um, in the next celebration of Pablo's life. Absolutely. I would like to thank everybody. There are some people um, who have worked incredibly hard on this, and that includes Raul Perez Monzon, without whom we could not have mounted this, who worked miracles with the technology, as did Ellen Johnson, um, the assistant of the Cuba program here at Columbia University, um, who has responded to every desperate call <laughs> that went out. And also thank you to Giselle who did a beautiful video of Pablo Armando, which caught his spirit. I think that was a extraordinary piece of work. Thank you, Giselle. And Giselle's mother, Soroya Castro, who Giselle told, help Meg out, she needs help. And so Soroya uh, put on her organizational boots and she went out and she helped enormously when emails and other uh, attempts to communicate did not work. Soraya made sure that messages got passed on, et cetera. So to everyone who not only spoke tonight and to all those that helped us behind the scenes, I want to thank you very, very warmly because without all of you and those in the audience, this could not have happened. And the quality of everybody's presentation was so extraordinary. I think we'll have to think about what we do with this. We recorded it, we will put it up on the website and on YouTube, but I think maybe we should do something more with it. So we will have to consult with Giselle amongst others about making this into a documentary. Thank you all on behalf of the Cuba program at Columbia University and a very, very special thank to Jean Capello who took on the very demanding role of moderator this evening and did it beautifully. Thank you. Peggy's here. Oh. No, again. Hello. 
We do have a little more, let me make sure I'm unmuted here. We have a little more time in our time slot. Uh, since everyone is friends, if you want to speak amongst yourselves, I, that wouldn't be problematic, would it, Meg? I wish we no. were all together with a glass of wine and, you know, rounding out the party. <laughs> Unfortunately, what we're all you think over we're not. <laughs> well, well, maybe. You think this guess. is water? Absolutely. Good for you, Sandra. Good for you. No, but uh, it, we have till nine o'clock in this time spot. If people, I know Philip Brenner's had to leave because he had a class to teach, but um, that's one of the hard things about Zoom, I think, is that leave button. You know, if we were all in the same room, we would kind of hang out and tell more stories and. There's no reason why we can't do that now, I guess. I did forget to say something which I really want to say. Is oh, it okay? Sure. Yeah. Everyone unmute yourselves. I think that's what we, yes. Well, let, we, let Sandra speak. Yes. It's very short, but I meant to tell it and I forgot because I didn't write anything down. Um, but when, um, when Pablo came after my mother died, I told him, since he was sleeping in my parents' bed while he was in Minneapolis, and I said, you know, I really want you to take whatever you want out of my parents' apartment to take back to Havana with you. And he said, oh, wonderful. Que puedo llevar? Y yo le dije, cualquier cosa que quieres, por supuesto. And he looked around the apartment and the first thing he chose, he said, I'd like to take the menorah because he was always trying to tell me he really thought he was Jewish. Yeah, I said, know. well, okay. okay, Pablo, you can take the menorah. Then he said, um, and I'd like to take the Kaddish cup. I said, Okay, you can take the cottage cup. And then he said, and I'd like to take the, the Masonic, the Masonic, the book, the book of the Masonic book, you know, with all the rules and regulations. My father was a Mason. I said, okay, Pablo. I thought it was so indicative of what Pablo cared about that those were the three items of everything in my parents' apartment that he chose to take back to Havana with him. And I was so moved when the next time I was in Cuba, I saw those three items on a little table in the corner of the family dining room. That's my story. Thank and you. Here. And here it is, Sandra. You're showing it to you. No? Can you hear me, Sandra? Sandra. Can you Sandra, can you hear yes. me? Yes, I can. Here it is for you to watch again. Oh, oh my I God. Just, I just wanted to, I think, well, my sisters asked me to speak in English because they spoke both of them in Spanish and they don't know if the uh, uh, you were able to get what uh, they said. I'm sure you understood. I think when there's so much uh, love and friendship in the air, language is not so important. I, I've, uh, I'm very touched and very moved because uh, I don't know if my father was a great writer or a great poet or a great intellectual, but I do know my father was a great, great human being. And uh, I got it. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm so fond of, uh, of oh, him, of what he taught us. Uh, like my sister, my little sister said, he taught us to love our family, love our country, Thank you. love our friends, to be good, to be true to ourselves. And I think those are very, very important. Um, I'm not going to say principles, but virtues that a human being can have. And uh, my father was so optimistic always. 
you came to him with a problem and uh, you tell he would always see the bright side of everything. I remember when I was sent to India and I said, but you see, I don't know, that country is so far away and there's lepra and uh, tuberculosis and all those things. And he said, Heka, but are you going to there to work as a translator? Or are you going to sleep with the Indians? <laughs> and then I had to laugh, you see, and uh, he was like that. He always see the good thing mm -hmm. about everything and show you the bright thing about everything. And I don't remember ever my father questioning any of our decisions of any of his children. I think that when he says, my mother wants me to be free, my mother, I think that is what he told us also. Mm -hmm. I want you to be free. I want you to take your own decisions. You have to live up to your decisions, of course, but you take your decisions. And that made us, I think, more responsible people. Uh, good people, I think. And uh, I think I've talked too much. I'm not supposed to say so much. But we do now. Thank Margaret. you all. I love seeing Nina, which I haven't seen for so many years. Sandra, I've seen you. Meg, I think I saw you before the pandemic. Uh, I've seen Phil. Uh, well, Yin, I met you here. But I want to thank you all, all of you, Nancy here, Reynaldo, all of you for such a wonderful, uh, what can we say, memorial, whatever. This is so much problem. Mm -hmm. What has happened here is so much problem. Mm -hmm. I think I, he, it's I think a celebration. That I and now Margaret Gilpin has arrived. So we'll okay. ask her to- uh, I've her been here the me. whole time. I don't know. Oh, we just I, didn't see yes. you when we you know, were- I want uh, to tell one very short story about how I met Pablo Armando. Sandy Levinson called me up one day. I must've been in the late seventies, early eighties and said, I've got somebody coming up from Cuba and I need you to put them up for a month. And I said, Sandy, I can't promise to put anybody up for a month who I've never met. I mean, at least give me a chance to meet the person and then, you know, let's see how that goes, right? So the day came and Pablo rang my bell. And this is a true story. I am not making it up. I opened the door and he looked in my eyes with those beautiful blue eyes of his. And I looked back and I said, come in and excuse me for one moment. And I went to the phone and I called Sandy and I said, he can stay for a month. <laughs> and that was how I got to know Pablo. And he stayed for a month. And then he came back for another month with Maruha and he stayed for another month. And the third time he came back with Maruha and stayed for another month. And in 1984, when I got a place in Cuba, the place they offered me was on the corner of Pablo Armando's house. <laughs> so... And so it speaks from there on. It is a very long time ago. So I thank you for that introduction, Sandy. It might never have happened. And it That's was what wonderful. happens when you have a small apartment that no yeah, one right. can stay in, except Reynaldo and Miguel. They, and, they well, I, I, I want to just send a, a big kiss to Reynaldo and to Nancy Hecker. I haven't seen you since pre-pandemic. And to Terry and Pablito. Y Gabriela y todo el mundo. Besos <laughs> y esperamos que nos vemos Beso, pronto. Pey. Besos, Besito, besito. <laughs> Thank you, Meg. You're welcome. <laughs> Is there anyone else that wants to talk? Well, I think then we will have to press the leave button and end this lovely evening that we all have had. It really has been remarkably special. That's been wonderful. Thank you all for coming. And I thank you. I really us. want to thank Giselle for that beautiful documentary. Oh, the film was marvelous. It was really wonderful. I hope that we can all 
somehow yeah we'll, we'll send an email with the with the link so that you can have a closer look and it's going okay. to have the okay. english subtitles so yeah and no, i'm i'm delighted to have done it. it it was really nice and emotional to go back to all those memories so i'm glad you enjoyed it thank you all very much it was beautiful. they're all the girls thank you it was very moving to see everybody and hear everybody. Love you all. Mm -hmm.